Good Thursday night. I am Tabum Lule and good to be with you tonight. Take on in focus. Let's begin here. Now, the Democratic Party is hoping to regain lost ground in the political battle state of North Carolina after losing support since Barack Obama's campaign in 2008. The region helped uh, win Donald Trump the election in 2016 by three percentage points and is the one percent point uh, in 2020. With a majority African-American population, Kamala Harris is looking to solidify that vote as well as that of young people in the elections that are just five days away. Our senior politics reporter Ziander Ngobo is in North Carolina at the campaign headquarters of the Democratic Party there. Ziander, good to have you with us tonight. What are we learning as uh, the uh, elections come closer and closer? Well, a very dynamic election it is setting out to be, uh, Tabo. And now we're at the headquarters of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Earlier, we went to two voting stations. We saw and spoke uh, to the North Carolina Republican Party campaign manager. And uh, it's neck and neck. But let's bring in uh, Tommy Mattox to get a sense of how you're feeling right now. You're the communications director for the Democratic Party. And I guess the first thing is that, um, you know, this isn't necessarily a predominantly blue state. You've only gotten it twice in the 1960s and 2008 with Barack Obama. What makes you think you might win it this time? You know, North Carolina is a 50-50 state. Our congressional delegation right now is seven Democrats, seven Republicans. What we face, though, is overwhelming gerrymandering by a Republican-led state legislature. But with our statewide candidates, our attorney general, our governor, we just had a two-term elected governor, Governor Cooper. We haven't had a Republican attorney general in our state since the 70s, I believe. And so we feel confident going into this year with the accomplishments of this administration, with the excitement of Kamala Harris as our vice president, now candidate. We feel real, real momentum on the ground, and we feel real energy that we haven't seen on the ground since Obama 08, which was the last time we were able to flip the state blue. Mm. And of course, um, you know, there are some questions around whether or not her entering so late in the race is the latest any mm. presidential candidate has entered the race four months before. Do you think that is helping you or possibly denting your prospects? I think it's actually really been a huge benefit. There's been so much excitement. I think people, unfortunately, were kind of bogged down by the same choice again. And so giving people a fresh choice, I think, on both sides, that we're seeing that it's real enthusiasm from people of both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party for Kamala Harris. So I think having the short window has actually been a benefit for us. And we've seen fundraising. We've seen folks stop by our headquarters who said they've never participated in an election before. And we really feel like the, the stakes of this election. When Donald Trump was president last time, he had a campaign promise of recruiting or appointing, nominating judge uh, judicial candidates to the Supreme Court who would overturn Roe v. Wade. And they did just that with all three of his nominees. And so we've seen the backlash of that. We've seen states enact extreme abortion bans. And so people have really seen that what they thought was truly scare tactics before have now become a reality, unfortunately, for a lot of women in this country. And now what we're seeing is real enthusiasm on the ground, but we're also seeing women outpacing men at the ballot box in all of our states, and especially right here in North Carolina. Over 3.2 million votes have been cast in the early voting process, which of course uh, closes on Saturday, the 2nd of November. But how are you feeling about the campaign trail. How are you going about canvassing those votes? Yeah, well, it's been really great with having Anderson as the youngest state party chair in the country. She brought real energy and enthusiasm, but she also brought a game plan of year-round organizing, year-round door knocking. And so we've been leaving it all in the field all year. What happened last time in 2020, this is the state that Joe Biden came the closest to winning, but he ended up losing by only one percentage point. And that's when the coordinated campaign came in halfway through the year in 2020. We're also locked down, virtual in a lot of cases because of COVID. Now now we've had year-round organizing, year-round door knocking, but also Anderson's had a real emphasis on rural areas and chipping away at the margins there. And so we've really had a presence in a lot of counties where they haven't seen a Dem in a long time. And we've given them a Democratic candidate to vote for in a lot of our state legislative races. But there's been real enthusiasm, real energy on the ground that we haven't seen in years. And like I said, folks have said this is they haven't seen anything like this since Obama 08. And now, you know, even Politico is saying don't sleep on North Carolina. <laughs> and uh, what are you telling, um, you know, the voters, the perspective voters. So you've got the 3.2 million. What indication does that give you at this stage? Well, they're also seeing candidates like Mark Robinson, who has 
very extreme. A lot of controversies have come out of his closet, uh, a lot of skeletons, if you will. And that's also been tampering down a lot of our, the candidates on the Republican side because a lot of them are embracing that extremism that a lot of practical North Carolinians on both sides of the aisle don't agree with and don't align with. And so while they're shifting to the right, North Carolinians are not shifting with them. And so having that also and to our advantage, because all of our candidates are bringing experience while their candidates are bringing extremism. And we've been able to paint that picture, but also lay out who, who these candidates are on that side, but who our candidates are on our side. I mean, one of the things about this election is the polling. It's been, I mean, arguably overly polled. Yes. Uh, do you do your own internal polling? Are you trusting the polls? What is your sense uh, about the state of your campaign right now? I think it's really hard to read the tea leaves in this election because yeah. you are seeing folks like Liz Cheney conservatives and AOC progressives embracing and fully endorsing Kamala Harris. You're not seeing Democrats for Trump. And so you're seeing people who are not leaving the Republican Party, but are saying, I'm taking a stance against this level of extremism against Donald Trump and voting for Kamala Harris because they realize sitting out doesn't do anything to help kind of veer away from that extremism. And so we're seeing uh, the biggest tent of a party we've ever seen. So it's hard to see when you see the tea leaves, uh, read the tea leaves when you see Republican turnout high, you know, our turnout is high, but also independence because how many of those Republicans are veering our direction? The internal polling looks really great. But like I said, women are outpacing men for the first time. And a large chunk of that is because they've seen the attacks on women's health care and women's rights coming from the right. And they disagree with that wholeheartedly. And what about young people? Um, you know, I was reading an article on PBS.org as well as Bloomberg. They're talking about how Kamala Harris also needs the Gen Zs to come out and vote. Um, you know, it's quite similar to what we had uh, back in, in South Africa as well, where young people were really rallied to come out and vote. What's the situation when it comes to voter turnout like in a state such as North Carolina? Well, I think we have so many great universities, public universities, private universities here. So we have a large voting block who are voting for the first time. But we've seen that since Kamala entered this race is a genuine excitement, whether it be Brat Summer. But though it's also really exciting having Anderson as our youngest state party chair. She has let folks know, even when Biden was the presumptive nominee, that what's at stake in this election and what Democrats are truly offering young people as we're, you know, when it comes to housing affordability, health care, all of these things, we've really painted that picture even before Kamala took over. So having Having Kamala as her nominee, bringing that fresh choice, that excitement. She is, like she says, she loves Gen Z, the, how impatient they are for change and how willing they are to fight for it. And so I think embracing that voting block has really empowered folks to realize how important their voice really does matter. All right. That's Tommy Mattox. He speaks for the Democratic Party here in North Carolina. It's neck and neck and not uh, deterred by the late entry into the race by Kamala Harris. In fact, the fresh choice, as Tommy put it, has uh, re-energized the campaign and they're extremely confident uh, that uh, they will secure North Carolina a one percentage point difference in 2020. That just tells you how tight it is here in the state of North Carolina. All right, that's News of Africa's uh, senior reporter there, uh, Zianda Ngobo, uh, on camera, uh, operated by Max uh, C. Lotolo.